In this video, I'm going to talk about neurotransmitters, which is the process that allows the communication between the axon terminal and the dendrite of, of two neurons. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to greatly magnify the little end of the axon terminal right here. Uh, so the entire video is just going to be about this connection. A long time ago, they thought that this connection was touching, so they thought it was just electrical signals that, that were sent from here to here, and they touched, and it just sent the signal. Now we know there's a tiny, tiny gap called a synapse that happens between these two connections. So I'm going to magnify this picture, and I'll draw a really big axon terminal and a really big dendrite. So here's the axon terminal, <clears throat> and here's the dendrite of the next neuron. Uh, and in between is the synapse. So the information goes from the axon terminal, which is these little flaggy army things, <clears throat> at the end of this neuron, through the synapse, which doesn't actually touch, the dendrite of the next neuron. Now the way that neurons communicate is they have these little teeny things called neurotransmitters, which are these little uh, balls that exist in the axon terminal. I'm trying to draw it uh, so it looks like a key, so it fits very specifically into what's called receptor sites on the dendrite. So I'm going to draw this little uh, kind of a weird looking thing, but I'm going to draw there's kind of a, <clears throat> a square and then an oval and then a triangle here. And then that, these neurotransmitters, so imagine there's a lot of these here on the axon terminal. And these fit into receptor sites on the dendrite. So I'll draw the dendrite to have these receptor sites. So I'm trying to draw little receptor sites that mirror um, the bad drawing that I've drawn in the neurotransmitters. So we have this neurotransmitter that looks like this. So it has the little square and then the circle and then the <coughs> triangle. This is like a key and a lock. So this key goes from the axon terminal. It goes into the synapse, just floats around in the goo and then it fits into the lock. And if it successfully fits into the lock, which this would because it looks generally like it would, then it sends a signal through the dendrite to the cell body and then it goes to the axon hill lock and if it's high enough, it sends through the axon and so on. It makes a, an action potential. But these neurotransmitters, the action potential from the axon goes to the neurotransmitters, releases the neurotransmitters into the synapse, they float around, they find the, the lock, so to speak, which is the receptor site. <clears throat> if they fit in, then it sends a signal through the dendrite and it goes on. And that's how neurotransmitters work. So some of the more common neurotransmitters are serotonin, which uh, neurotransmitters are very complicated, so they often do a lot of things. Serotonin, one of the things it does, just to oversimplify it, would be that it reduces having serotonin, reduces anxiety and depression. Another neurotransmitter is dopamine. Uh, dopamine is very complicated as well. And actually too much dopamine will cause schizophrenia. So it'll make you see things, be delusional, think things that aren't actually real. And having too little of dopamine makes you have Parkinson's disease, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with schizophrenia. So it's a little bit odd that that would be the case. Uh, a third neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine, and these are just some of the common neurotransmitters that I wanted to talk about. Acetylcholine has to do with movement. So if you are successfully moving your fingers, that's because the axon terminals and the dendrites of the neurons that are involved in movement are successfully sending the acetylcholine neurotransmitters into the synapse, binding with the receptor sites, and sending action potentials. So it only has to do with movement, so too much of it would make sense that it would have to do with seizures. So if you have too much, you, you move too much, you seize around, and if you have too little, then you're paralyzed.
<clears throat> There's actually, I believe it is the venom of a black widow that works on acetylcholine. And if you get bitten by the black widow, uh, it produces a synthetic acetylcholine, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, which basically gives you too much acetylcholine, which then makes you seize. Too much movement, which is a bad thing. So that's the way neurotransmitters work when they're actual neurotransmitters. So pretty straightforward. When it gets really cool and interesting is when you get what's called agonists and antagonists. And an agonist basically works as a neurotransmitter. So it does the same thing as the neurotransmitter. And the way that it does that is it is basically a fake neurotransmitter that looks enough like the neurotransmitter. You see, I'm, I'm erasing the triangle piece there. So now I've made a fake neurotransmitter, and this would now be the agonist of uh, whatever neurotransmitter this was. So we could say this is serotonin, and this neurotransmitter that I've made that has two of the three pieces for the neurotransmitter would be an agonist. So it would act the same way as the neurotransmitter. So what that means is this neurotransmitter would go into the synapse, and it it looks like kind of it would fit into the, the receptor site. So I, I think of it like, it's a key that you got made and you didn't really go to a locksmith to make the key. Maybe you went to uh, some bargain store and it looked kind of like a sketchy key shop and you can look at the key after you had it made and it, it kind of looks like it's the right key, but you can definitely see some differences. But when you put it in the door, it definitely still turns. So that's what happens with an agonist. It, it mimics the neurotransmitter well enough that it, it looks enough like it that it still goes into the synapse and it binds to the receptor site. And it's not perfect, but it's good enough to fire. So an agonist of serotonin will still make you feel good. An agonist of dopamine will still, uh, well, too much of it would make you have schizophrenia-like symptoms. An agonist of acetylcholine will still allow you to move or too much of it would uh, make you move too much. Then you have an antagonist, and that's when you, this key that you've made in my example, uh, you went to a really, it's, it's almost like there was a guy on the side of the street and he said, hey man, I can make you a key. And you said, eh, all right. And he made you a key and it looks, I mean, sort of like the key, but really not much at all. So it just has this one piece that looks like a neurotransmitter. And the only thing it does, it looks enough like the key that it, still fits into the receptor site, but just bad enough that it actually clogs it. So you have this neurotransmitter and it fits, it goes in the synapse, it fits, but the only thing it does, it doesn't actually fire, it just fits and it clogs up the works. Now you have all these basically fake neurotransmitters that are clogging the receptor site, so the real neurotransmitters now can't do anything. So an agonist basically does the same thing as a neurotransmitter. And then an antagonist is like the really bad key that actually does the opposite of the neurotransmitter. Because what it does is it, again, it, it fits into the receptor site just well enough to fit, but only well enough just to clog up the works and make actual neurotransmitters not able to fire. So let's think about this. Now, if we have uh, too little serotonin, since serotonin has to do with the happies, then when you have enough serotonin, you feel sufficiently happy and you're not that anxious, but if uh, people that have depression often have a shortage of serotonin, so they don't have enough. So what we can do is we can give them an agonist of serotonin. So we don't actually increase the amount of serotonin they have, but we'll give them this thing that's like fake serotonin. So it fits well enough to still fire and that will then make them happy. Now, if they don't have enough serotonin, they're gonna have the sad. And what we can do about that, we can do a few things, but one thing we could do, uh, well, we could give them an agonist of serotonin is prevent the reuptake of serotonin. So what serotonin does, pretending like this is serotonin, serotonin goes from the axon terminal and it goes, shoo, hangs out in the synapse, then it binds to the receptor site, that makes the dendrite fire, and then it goes back into the synapse and then it goes back into the axon. That happens uh, hundreds of times a second. The process where it goes back into the axon terminal is called reuptake. And what SSRIs do, which is like uh, your drugs, if you know Lexapro, I think Zoloft, drugs like that, what they do is they, 
so people with depression, they have too little serotonin, so the serotonin ordinarily goes into the dendrite, makes it fire, it goes back into the synapse, back into the axon terminal. SSRIs, they block the uh, reuptake ability, so they'll block these reuptake areas, and then what that does is once the serotonin goes into the synapse and binds, then it can't go back because there's this block. So it forces all the serotonin just to hang out in the synapse. That way it's more easily accessible. So with an SSRI with a reuptake inhibitor, we're not actually making any new serotonin in the example of serotonin. What we're doing is we're making the body's own serotonin more efficient, basically. So a person with depression might not have enough serotonin, but we can just make their serotonin just have to hang out in the synapse. That way it's closer to the, the receptor sites and it's just easier for them to bind. So just to review this, uh, the neurotransmitter section, serotonin, the three of the most common neurotransmitters are serotonin, dopamine, and acetylcholine. Serotonin has to do with good mood. So if you have enough of it or, or even too much of it, which probably would be a good thing, uh, you feel happy. If you don't have enough of it, you feel depressed and anxious. And again, this is an oversimplification. Dopamine works on a lot of ways, but one thing that happens, if you have too much of it, you all of a sudden become schizophrenic. You start to see things that aren't there and you, you see delusions, or you don't see delusions. You, you think things that aren't true, which is delusions. And if you don't have enough of it, then you would have Parkinson's. And then acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that has to do with movement. So if you have too much of it, then you have seizures. And if you don't have enough of it, then you're paralyzed. You can't. And there's, there's a neurotransmitter which does these things and, and a ton of others, different types of neurotransmitters that do a ton of different things. Then there's also an app which mimics a neurotransmitter because it, it's shaped just close enough uh, to bind to the receptor site and still fire. Then there's an antagonist, which is sort of kind of like it's the, home, the, the hobo on the side of the street gave you the key, and it really just now does not look right. And it, it fits well enough to clog up the works and does not fire. And these are both kind of synthetic or uh, fake neurotransmitters. So if a person has schizophrenia, we could give them an antagonist. Oops, I wrote agonist there. We could give them an antagonist of dopamine, which actually uh, is what antipsychotic drugs are. So we could give them an antagonist of dopamine that would reduce their symptoms. But if someone with Parkinson's disease, which is a, a you have too little amount of dopamine, we could give them an agonist of dopamine, but it actually turns out there's not such a thing. So you have to uh, do something like a, a reuptake inhibitor for that. But if it did exist, we could give them an agonist of dopamine, a synthetic dopamine, and that would fix Parkinson's. With acetylcholine, someone has seizures, we could give them an antagonist of acetylcholine, which would calm down their seizures. If they had paralysis, we could give them an agonist, which would fix that. Uh, also, a person with too little serotonin, we could give them an agonist of serotonin, or we could give them an SSRI, which would um, prevent the reuptake of the feel-good neurotransmitter there, and so then it, it becomes more efficient.